Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to today's US-Canada Hands-Off Venezuela webinar, Free Alex Saab Online Action. We will start in three minutes as people enter the webinar. Bienvenido y bienvenidos todo. Vamos a comenzar en tres minutos. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, US-Canada Hands-Off Venezuela Free Alex Saab. It is a special online action marking one year of consecutive online monthly pickets where people from across the United States and Canada have gathered united uh, to demand an end to the criminal blockade on Venezuela and freedom for Alex Saab, a Venezuelan diplomat currently held in Florida. Bienvenido y bienvenidas todo y todas a nuestra acción de hoy. Estamos aquí a presentar nuestra unidad contra los, el bloqueo criminal contra Venezuela y también con, eh, para, um, para exigir libertad para Alex so, gracias a todos que están escribiendo en el chat. Thank you to everyone that's writing in the chat. Uh, saludos desde Canadá a todos los venezolanos que están con nosotros aquí. Thank you to all the Venezuelans, especially that have joined us with us here today from the Free Alex Saab campaign. Soy Alison Bolin, la coordinadora de la campaña en solidaridad con Venezuela de Fire This Time desde Canada. Mi nombre es Alison Bodine. I am here uh, speaking from Vancouver, British Columbia as the coordinator of the Fire This Time Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. Y antes de todo, and before everything, I want to let people know we are doing simultaneous translation for the webinar tonight. To hear the simultaneous translation in your meeting controls, click the interpretation button the globe icon that is at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a phone, you may have to click more. Then click the language that you would like to participate in, English or Spanish. From there, I also recommend that you change the setting to mute original audio, which you will also find. Para escuchar la interpretación simultánea de esta acción, Necesita, tú necesitas um, 
a poner en los controles de este reunión o webinar, haga clic en la interpretación, un icono de globo que está abajo en tu escran, ecran o eh, es una parte diferente en su móvil y haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar, en este caso en inglés o español. Y para escuchar solo el idioma interpretada, haga clic en silenciar audio original. Y si tienes preguntas, ponerlos en el chat y nuestra uh, persona de Stay Fire This Time, as a Rojvi, puede ayudarte con cosas de interpretación. Y mil gracias a nuestras intérpretes. Thank you so much to the people that are helping with interpretation today. So now uh, we will continue with the program. I encourage people to please keep typing in the chat where you are joining us here from. As I said, this event today is going to be broadcast from Vancouver, BC, Canada. We are on the traditional and unceded territories of the tsleil Musqueam, and Swamish Coast Salish nations. And we recognize that we do our work for social justice here from unceded and stolen territory. Today, we are marking one year of consecutive online monthly pickets. We are gathered from across the United States and Canada as people from many different walks of life to demand US Canada hands off Venezuela and free Alex Saab. There are posters uh, that were created for today's action, and I would be remiss not to mention that the free Alex Saab campaign in Venezuela has made a beautiful poster too, actually, for the event today. We can put those up on the screen again and show everyone uh, very beautiful posters that were created direct from Venezuela to help us build the action to today and to build our demands for freedom for Alex Saab. Again, my name is Alison Bodine. I'm the coordinator of the Fire This Time movement for social justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, an author of Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela, a book from Battle of Ideas Press. Today's action has been organized by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg and the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, with the support of Venezuela Solidarity organizations and individuals across Canada. After a terrific panel of speakers, including Indriana Parada, a Venezuelan lawyer, a video greeting from the wife of Alex Saab, Camilla Saab, David Denny, the General Secretary of Friends of Venezuela Committee in Barbados, and Adrian Pine, a Dr. Adrian Pine, a US-based anthropologist and retired professor, one of the four members of the Embassy Protection Collective, we will have greetings from Professor Luis Acuna, the Charge d'Affaires of the Venezuela Embassy in Canada, and also greetings from solidarity groups across Canada and Quebec. Then we will be asking everyone uh, to turn on their cameras, hold up a sign if you have one, but most importantly, hold up a fist or a peace sign and say, free Alex Saab united together. Mm -hmm. The cruelty of, US, of the United States government's attacks on Venezuela also extends to those working to alleviate the impact of the sanctions and blockade on Venezuela. In June, on June 12, 2020, Alex Saab, over 600 days ago, was arrested in Cape Verde while en route to Iran to negotiate shipments of fuel and humanitarian supplies for Venezuela. Since being kidnapped by the United States government on October 16th, 2021, when he was in Cape Verde, he has been held in jail in Miami, awaiting a trial on trumped up charges of money laundering. For the past 12 months, people have united in online picket actions because as people living in the United States and Canada, we have the responsibility to stand with the people of Venezuela as they defend their sovereignty and self-determination. We will continue to join with the people and government of Venezuela 
to demand the end of all cruel sanctions against Venezuela and the immediate freedom for Alex Saab, which we know through our united action is possible. Without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker for today. It is my pleasure to introduce Indriana Parada. She is a Venezuelan lawyer and a member of the movement for the liberation of Alex Saab in Venezuela. She is joining us tonight speaking direct from Venezuela. If you missed it before, she will be presenting in Spanish. So if you would need to listen to the interpretation, please do be sure to click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Idriana, the floor is yours. Hola, buenas noches. En primer lugar, quiero enviar un afectuoso saludo a todos los compañeros de Canadá y Quebec que se han organizado en grupos de solidaridad con Venezuela. Desde la tierra de Bolívar, muchas gracias. Y a los compañeros en Estados Unidos. También quiero saludar de manera especial a todos los panelistas que hoy nos acompañan. David Denny, secretario general de Friends of Venezuela. El doc la doctora Adrian Payne, una de nuestras héroes protectoras de la Embajada de Venezuela en Estados Unidos. El profesor Luis Acuña, encargado de negocios de la Embajada de Venezuela en Canadá. Un afectuoso abrazo. Y por supuesto, la compañera Alison Bodine, coordinadora de la campaña de solidaridad con Venezuela del Movimiento por la Justicia Social y quien hizo posible que hoy nos encontráramos para conversar tan importante tema. A todos, reciban desde Venezuela nuestra gratitud. Podemos iniciar diciendo que desde el año 2015, tanto Canadá como el mundo ha sido testigo de uno de los ataques sistemáticos y más inhumanos que ha vivido Venezuela en los últimos tiempos, como es la imposición de medidas coercitivas, unilaterales e ilegales por parte del gobierno de los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica, y a los cuales se han sumado gobiernos como, como el de Canadá o, por ejemplo, como los de la Unión Europea, con el único propósito de frenar la revolución bolivariana y atacar el sistema eh, de gobierno humanista, solidario, de igualdad, pero que sobre todo, y lo más importante, que fue elegido por la población venezolana a través de la, de la vía democrática por excelencia, como es las elecciones o el voto, el sufragio universal, directo y secreto. Esto desde el año 1999, pero que además se ha venido renovando bajo un mandato constitucional y que ha obtenido de manera reiterada el respaldo popular. Sin embargo, hemos visto cómo ha sido empeño de los Estados Unidos imponerle a Venezuela y no solamente a Venezuela, sino también a los más de 30 países que actualmente se encuentran ilegalmente sancionados, estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales e ilegales que se alejan de los espíritus y propósitos de los principios de las Naciones Unidas, como lo es el principio de igualdad soberana entre estados, el principio de solidaridad internacional, los principios de soberanía, autodeterminación y sobre todo la paz y seguridad internacional. Hoy, en Venezuela suman 502 sanciones unilaterales que han afectado de manera profunda a la población venezolana. La relatora especial de las Naciones Unidas sobre el impacto de las medidas coercitivas en el disfrute y goza de los derechos humanos, la doctora Alena Don Juan, ha expresado en sus diferentes informes que estas medidas son contrarias al derecho internacional, al derecho humanitario y también a la Carta de las Naciones Unidas. Vimos entonces cómo no solo se han venido profundizando a lo largo de estos años todas estas sanciones ilegales, sino también acciones injerencistas a través de la promoción de acciones golpistas, como por ejemplo, tratar de imponerle a Venezuela un gobierno paralelo que viola de manera directa la, la constitución nacional y a través del cual se nos han robado recursos importantísimos y han pretendido saquear todos nuestros activos, golpeando de manera sistemática la moneda y la economía de Venezuela. Como consecuencia de todo ello, vivimos entre los años 2016 y 2019 con mayor agudeza 
momentos de desabastecimiento de medicinas, combustibles, alimentos, materias primas necesarias para mover todo el aparato productivo nacional. Vimos cómo, por ejemplo, se bloquearon buques que traían alimentos a Venezuela. Vimos cómo se bloquearon y fueron robados como un acto de piratería los buques que traían combustibles a Venezuela. Se bloquearon las cuentas internacionales, en bancos internacionales, que le impidió al gobierno nacional poder cancelar sus compromisos internacionales y de alguna manera acceder al sistema financiero internacional, generando de esta manera consecuencias graves a la población, pero sobre todo a la población más humilde, pues a ellos es que está dirigida a estas sanciones inhumanas para causarles un sufrimiento mayor, tal como lo dijo William Brownfield en el año 2018, constituyendo entonces estas acciones un verdadero delito de lesa humanidad según el Estatuto de Roma. Como respuesta a todas estas medidas, el presidente Nicolás Maduro entonces convocó a todo el empresariado nacional y a todos los factores productivos de Venezuela para que en conjunto con el decreto de emergencia económica como instrumento legal poder hacer frente a todas estas agresiones y así lograr reabastecer nuevamente al país, no solamente de alimentos, sino también de eh, todas las medicinas que lograrían salvar miles de vidas. Alex Saab fue una de estas personas que acudió al llamado del presidente y en conjunto con él eh, enfrentó, comenzaron a enfrentar esta cruzada para vencer el bloqueo y devolverle el oxígeno a la población. Alex Saab es un ciudadano colombo-venezolano que le hizo frente al bloqueo y logró traer a Venezuela alimentos, medicinas, combustibles de manera exitosa en medio de una persecución brutal. Es por ello que en abril del año 2018 es nombrado enviado especial de Venezuela y es importante recalcar que se hizo con la finalidad de proteger y poder garantizar el cumplimiento de su misión, que en ese momento era muy importante y revestía un carácter de seguridad nacional. Por este motivo, Alex Saab es posteriormente identificado por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos, convirtiéndose entonces en un objetivo de guerra, por lo que fue sancionado por el Departamento del Tesoro en el año 2019, a pesar que en ese momento ya él era enviado especial de Venezuela, lo que le permitía tener una protección internacional especial, que es la inmunidad diplomática, como lo establece la Convención de Viena, de 1961 para las relaciones diplomáticas. Vimos entonces cómo en junio del año 2020, en medio del cumplimiento de una misión humanitaria entre Venezuela y la República Islámica de Irán, que, que tenía como objetivo adquirir alimentos, combustibles y medicinas para enfrentar la pandemia del COVID-19 que azota al mundo en estos momentos, Alex Saab, Mientras se encontraba en tránsito por el archipiélago de Cabo Verde, fue interceptado por las autoridades de esta nación y de manera ilegal fue arrojado del avión en el que se desplazaba para iniciar desde ese día entonces lo que es el primer secuestro al diplomático venezolano o a un diplomático venezolano, que hoy suman ya 608 días de secuestro. 491 de los cuales transcurrieron dentro de Cabo Verde, en medio de torturas, amenazas, violación permanente a sus derechos humanos. Alex Saab fue retenido sin, sin ninguna notificación roja de Interpol, la cual llegó un día después de haber iniciado ya su secuestro. También fue retenido sin orden de aprehensión válida, la cual debemos informar, llegó casi un año después. Una vez ya comenzado el cautiverio, constituyendo esto una detención arbitraria y violando de manera directa el Pacto Internacional de Derechos Civiles y Políticos. Y debemos retomar, la notificación roja de Interpol llegó un día después y la, de, y la orden de detención llegó casi un año después. Esto constituye una detención arbitraria que viola el Pacto Internacional de Derechos Civiles y Políticos y la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. Alex Saab fue sometido de manera constante a crueles torturas. Aislamiento, fue sometido a un aislamiento total durante siete meses, sin poder ver la luz del día o el sol. No tenía iluminación ni artificial ni natural. 
Esto hizo que perdiera parcialmente su vista. Su única manera de comunicación era escribir cartas. Sin embargo, cuando las identificaron, también se lo impidieron. Fue golpeado diar diariamente. Usaron mecanismos de torturas como la asfixia para lograr que firmara una declaración voluntaria de extradición, pero sobre todo para amedrentarlo y lograr de él confesiones falsas en contra de Venezuela y en contra del presidente Nicolás Maduro. Además, se le exigía que dejara de trabajar y ayudar a Venezuela. Fue, fue sometido a un proceso judicial ilegal, manipulado por los propios agentes de Estados Unidos dentro de Cabo Verde, en donde se le violó de manera reiterada su legítimo derecho a la defensa. Debemos decir que Cabo Verde cerró totalmente sus fronteras y, no, y se le impidió a cualquier persona que pretendiera visitar, defender, conocer o simplemente documentar el caso de Alex Sabo. La única excepción que hizo Cabo Verde fue con la persona encargada de levantar todas las mentiras y falsas acusaciones en contra de Venezuela y en contra del propio diplomático, un periodista llamado Roberto Denis, quien hoy, por cierto, se encuentra prófugo a la justicia de Venezuela por delitos de difamación. Tampoco se le permitió al diplomático Alex Saab tener contacto con su esposa ni con ninguno de sus cinco hijos, tres de ellos menores de edad. Son dos hermosas niñas que apenas cuentan con 24 meses y 5 años y un adolescente de 11 años de edad que llora cada día la ausencia de su padre. La bebé más pequeña tenía 5 meses de edad, por lo cual no conoce a su padre en el momento en que, se, en que fue ejecutado el secuestro. Esta, la, el, la esposa, la, la compañera Camila Fabrizá, en conjunto con sus dos niñas, fueron declaradas personas no gratas en Cabo Verde y de esta manera impedir que entraran a, a esta nación y poder tener contacto con él. Al día de hoy, todavía no les preguntamos al gobierno de Cabo Verde qué peligro real ha podido constituir una joven madre y esposa en, en conjunto con sus dos niñas para, para esta nación. Este caso fue conocido por el Tribunal de Justicia de los Países de la Comunidad Económica eh, de África Occidental, quien luego de evaluar todos los hechos y las evidencias, declaró el 15 de marzo del año 2021 que el diplomático Alex Saab debía ser liberado de manera inmediata por tratarse de una detención arbitraria y por violar flagrantemente sus derechos humanos y el derecho internacional. Sin embargo, Cabo Verde hizo caso omiso de, de la solicitud de este tribunal internacional. De igual modo, el Consejo de Derechos Humanos de las Naciones Unidas, a través de un grupo de trabajo y cuatro relatorías especiales, solicitó expli explicaciones al gobierno de Cabo Verde por todos estos graves hechos de tortura y de violación al derecho internacional. También le solicitó detener el proceso de extradición y permitirle acceder a medicamentos y a una atención médica, pues Alex Saab es un sobreviviente de cáncer de estómago. Esto también fue ignorado por Cabo Verde. Posteriormente, el 16 de octubre del año 2021, como lo decía la compañera Alison Modine, un día antes de las elecciones presidenciales en Cabo Verde, que probablemente le darían la libertad a nuestro diplomático, de manera abrupta, el gobierno de los Estados Unidos decidió llevárselo por la fuerza sin respetar ningún proceso legal, sin notificación previa ni a su familia ni a sus abogados, para concretar entonces lo que es el segundo secuestro del diplomático Alex Saab y una nueva forma de agresión a Venezuela. Pues con esta acción rompieron de manera directa el proceso de diálogo y negociación que se llevaba en la Ciudad de México entre el gobierno nacional y las oposiciones. Pues Alex Saab es miembro delegado eh, miembro y delegado permanente de esta mesa de diálogo y negociación. Alex Saab lleva 117 días en una celda en los Estados Unidos, aislado, constituyendo esta una de, las, de sus formas de tortura. Y debemos denunciar que al día de hoy lleva 11 días totalmente incomunicado en una celda de máxima seguridad por lo que ni su esposa ni sus abogados han podido conocer de su condición de salud ni su estado emocional. Alex Saab está enfrentando un proceso ilegal con el que se están violando más de seis convenciones internacionales 
y todo el derecho internacional que además pone en grave peligro las relaciones diplomáticas en el mundo. Nosotros podemos decir que el día de hoy la condición legal del diplomático Alex Saab dentro de los Estados Unidos la calificamos como un limbo jurídico, pues al no existir el reconocimiento por parte de la administración de Joe Biden al gobierno legítimo del presidente Nicolás Maduro, no se le está garantizando al diplomático Alex Saab sus derechos consulares como funcionario diplomático. Tampoco se le están garantizando sus derechos familiares al no permitirle contacto con su, con su esposa ni con sus hijos violando de manera directa el Pacto Internacional de Derechos Económicos, Sociales y Culturales. Pero a, a la vez, a sus dos pequeñas niñas o a sus hijos menores de edad, se le están violando lo establecido en el convenio de, en los, convenios de, los, de los derechos del niño, en el convenio internacional de los derechos del niño. Sin embargo, debemos destacar que Estados Unidos es, un, es uno de los dos únicos países que no ha ratificado esta importante, esta importante convención dentro de los países de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas. El secuestro de Alex Saab es una forma de agresión a Venezuela, pues con esto quisieron impedir que él siguiera trayendo alimentos y los insumos necesarios para vencer el bloqueo. Hermanos de Canadá, de Estados Unidos y del mundo, Alex Saab está secuestrado en una cárcel de los Estados Unidos por traer alimentos a sus connacionales, por luchar junto con el presidente Nicolás Maduro en contra de un cruel bloqueo que buscó asesinar de manera generalizada a la población venezolana. Así que el caso del diplomático Alex Saab lo podemos resumir en tres grandes áreas. El área de la violación directa a los derechos humanos al tratarse de hechos de tortura y detención arbitraria. El área de agresión directa hacia Venezuela, pues a través de él han querido golpear la institucionalidad venezolana. Y el, grave, y el área de la grave violación al derecho internacional al tratarse de un funcionario representante de un Estado soberano. Finalizo recordando al mundo que hoy van 608 días que Alex Saab no ve a su familia. Van 608 días que se le están violando sus derechos humanos fundamentales. 608 días que no han presentado una sola prueba en su contra, simplemente porque no existen. Van 608 días de violación a la soberanía de Venezuela. Quiero finalizar invitándolos a todos a acompañarnos este y todos los 16 de cada mes, a activarnos a través de las redes sociales en movimiento constante para exigir la libertad de Alex Saab y que además este 16 de febrero va a ser eh, llevado a cabo la audiencia que está prevista en el Distrito Sur de la Florida, sobre la audiencia de estatus. Es por ello que nosotros exigimos en la libertad de Alex Saab y el levantamiento de todas las sanciones a Venezuela y todos los países ilegalmente sancionados. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Thank you very much. Idriana Parada, it is really a, a pleasure to have you here today. What a important uh, connection that you've been able to make between the criminal blockade that Venezuela is, uh, is imposed on Venezuela by the US government, by the government of Canada, and uh, the illegal and cruel detention and arrest of, of uh, Alex Saab. We are uh, really, um, will continue from here in Canada across North America to join with uh, the campaigns on the 16th of every month, uh, marking Alex Saab's illegal imprisonment and also uh, in every uh, place and um, really from everywhere that we can express our solidarity and really build an, a global campaign for freedom for Alex Saab. Although he's being held in the United States, we know it is an international campaign that will be able to bring about his freedom to return him to Camilla Saab and his family and to the people of Venezuela and to the important work he was doing to really break this criminal blockade on Venezuela. So as people from here in Canada, we must uh, be united behind the campaign to free Alex Saab and uh, bring this information that Idriana has just presented us to our workplaces, to classrooms, and uh, to the dinner table everywhere we can to talk about his important case for human rights. Um, we have within the program a few more perspectives on the case of Alex Saab and 
of really building the struggle in against US sanctions and blockade and for freedom of Alex Saab. Uh, but I wanted to next move to the part in our program uh, where we are really honored to have a video from Camilla Saab. Camilla is the wife of Alex Saab. She has been uh, fighting tirelessly for his freedom uh, against really difficult conditions, of course, not being able to even have contact with him or hear from him in recent days and having to withstand as well the fact that he has faced uh, torture underneath uh, his conditions of imprisonment, both in Cape Verde and now in the United States. So uh, I hope that everyone uh, will gain strength from the words of Camilla Saab that follow here. And again, it is an honor to, to have this video. Thank you so much to Camilla Saab and to the Alex Saab campaign in Venezuela fighting for his freedom. Hola a todos, eh, me llamo Camila Fabri y soy la esposa del diplomático venezolano secuestrado por parte de los Estados Unidos, Alex Saab. Hoy eh, quiero agradecer a Ends of eh, Venezuela para organizar este evento, para hablar de los terribles efectos eh, que tienen la medida coercitiva unilaterales. Eh, también Alex eh, es víctima de esta medida coercitiva unilaterales. Él, para burlar estas sanciones, estas medidas, fue secuestrado por los Estados Unidos para ayudar a Venezuela a traer alimentos, medicinas y materias primas e insumos por el COVID-19. Son 609 días que eh, yo no puedo ver a mi esposo, que mi esposo permanece secuestrado por los Estados Unidos y eh, sus hijas no pueden ver a su papá. Son eh, 609 días que él no ve, eh, no tiene atención médica, no recibe atención médica, que no puede ver luz solar, que eh, ha sufrido torturas física y psicológica en todo este tiempo. Permaneció 500 uh, días en Cabo Verde recibiendo cualquier tipo de torturas. Fue, uh, le han uh, roto muelas, le han pegado, han tratado de firmar una extradición voluntaria, um, han tratado de sacarle una declaración falsa contra el gobierno venezolano y contra su presidente. Um, él está siendo violado de cualquier derecho básico. No ha recibido ningún tipo de visita consular tampoco. No puede recibir visita familiar. Le pido por favor que hagan conocer más el caso de Alex, de mi esposo, y me ayuden en esta batalla que yo sé que vamos a vencer. Muchas gracias a todos. Hola a todos. Me llamo Camila Fabri y soy la esposa de la... Free Alex Saab, Camila Saab, estamos contigo. Camila Saab, we are with you. Uh, thank you again to the Free Alex Saab campaign for uh, providing that video. And um, from the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, uh, to the many different groups and individuals united across Canada as part of these US-Canada Hands Off Venezuela picket actions, uh, let us redouble and recommit our efforts for the immediate freedom of Alex Saab. Thank you. Next, uh, we have uh, words from a fighter uh, who has been leading the efforts to free Alex Saab from the Caribbean. Uh, he is one of the founders of the Free Alex Saab campaign in the Caribbean, and also uh, just a, a fighter against uh, the cruel and criminal sanctions against Venezuela. David Denny is the General Secretary of the Friends of Venezuela Committee in Barbados, and a leading organizer also with the Caribbean Movement for Peace and Integration. The floor is yours, David. Let me say thanks to you for giving me this opportunity from the Caribbean region to 
address this very important issue. I am representing, as you mentioned, the Venezuelan Solidarity Committee in Barbados and the Caribbean Movement for Peace and Integration, and also the Progressive Caribbean Movement, because we are very concerned about this case and this issue. We are also very concerned about the many attacks against Venezuela because the attacks against Venezuela are not only against the Venezuelan people, the attacks are against the poor and powerless people of the Americas. And we are feeling it right here in our Caribbean region because the embargo have created problems for the Pekka Caribbean Agreement. Now, the work that Alex Slab was doing, some may say that it was for the Venezuelan people. But for us in the Caribbean, it was for more than just the Venezuelan people. It was for many of the people of the Caribbean region that were benefiting from the Bolivarian Revolution. And I just mentioned that we have benefited from the Pecha Caribbean Agreement, but we have also benefited from the IKEA program that was developed by Venezuela and Cuba to help many poor people in our region who were suffering for medical assistance. So that Alex Saab, for us, is a contributor to that process that would have helped to save the con and created the conditions for many Caribbean people to see. So we feel connected to Alex Saab, who was a diplomat and who are now being harassed, imprisoned, and treated the worst way by the government of the United States of America. So our movement support what our Canadian brothers and sisters are doing here. Our movement support what is happening globally because there are also campaigns in Africa that are calling for the freedom of our brother from Venezuela. And we have to find a way to strongly internationalize the struggle because we are also fighting against an imperialist media that will not give us the opportunity to explain this kind of behavior in that kind of media setting that is totally against the struggles for the poor and powerless people, the struggles for the Cuban Revolution and the Bolivarian Revolution. We are fighting against those elements. So we have to develop a mass and popular movement so that the world, especially working class people in churches, trade unions, and civil society must have a clear picture and a clear understanding of what is happening to our brother from Venezuela and his family and his children. 
But we have a lot of work to do. And we can only do this successfully if we unite ourselves together and share our resources so that we can fight and create a campaign that will educate our people about this situation and condition. Because the government of the United States of America, they're very, I don't know what term to use, but they're very heartless men and women. Because what has our brother done to the United States of America? Nothing. But yet still, he and his family are forced to suffer because of US imperialism and because the United States of America want to do everything possible to create the conditions for hardship for the Venezuelan people. So that I am very happy to be here with you tonight. I am very happy to be part of a process that represents honesty, that represents the people of our region. Because the battle is not only for Alexander. This battle is a battle against US imperialism that is doing everything possible to create economic and political problem for the people of Venezuela. And Venezuela is a friendly country that has been extending its arms to help our people. So brothers and sisters, I want to end by saying that this is one of the most important struggle for all of us. And we have to find a way to let working class people at the trade union level, in the churches, social movements, all of the organizations that organize people in the Americas, we have to find a way to reach them so that they know what is happening. Because I know within the Caribbean, only progressive forces know what is happening because the media in our region are not dealing with these issues. So the people don't know what is happening. And we have a duty. We have a duty as progressive minded people to find the solutions and, cre and to create the conditions so we can reach our people. So brothers and sisters, the Caribbean move of peace and integration are here with you. The Friends of Venezuela Solidarity Committee in Barbados are here with you. The Cuban Barbadian Friendship Association right here in Barbados are here with you. And we will help you fight this struggle. Long live the Bolivarian Revolution and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you to David Denny. Uh, joining us from Barbados It is uh, really uh, great to have you with us here today to express that unity between the Caribbean, Latin America, and those of us in the United States and Canada. When we stand together we and united, we are stronger. Uh, we can win. We have won. And we will win freedom for Alex Saab and lift these criminal sanctions on Venezuela. And there is uh, so much work that we can and will do together and appreciate your time of being here and making those important connections. Also to recognize that we are in February, which is Black History Month, sanctions imposed by the United States impact 
marginalized people the most, including Afro-Venezuelans. And I uh, think it's important that we recognize that and recognize the leadership that Afro-Venezuelans have as well in the struggle for the freedom of Alex Saab and in the Bolivarian revolutionary process, asserting Venezuela's sovereignty and independence against criminal US sanctions and attacks. So um, we will win, venceremos. This is, this is the theme of today. It is an incredible one year uh, picket. We've had 12 of these US, Canada, hands off Venezuela, free Alex Saab actions. And uh, today is a great example of really the the sense of struggle and unity that we have with one another in these important campaigns and how much work we have to continue to do. I encourage people to follow the chat. It's going very fast, but a lot of very um, encouraging and uh, beautiful comments of struggle and solidarity in the chat coming especially from our Venezuelan uh, brothers and sisters that are joining us here today. Next up, I want to introduce Professor Luis Acuna. Uh, Professor Luis Acuna is the former governor of the state of Sucre in Venezuela. He is now the charge de affairs of the Venezuelan embassy in Canada, but he's speaking not from Canada, but from Venezuela. Because of the breakdown and, and really the imposition of bad relations between Venezuela and Canada on the government of Canada's part, uh, Luis Acuna is not able to perform his duties as charge d'affaires from within this country. And so he is in Venezuela uh, continuing his work. And we are honored every month to have uh, some greetings and perspective from Professor Luis Acuna. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining. We are not getting any sound either. We might have to try again in a minute. Luis, we cannot hear you. Uh, we think it might be muted on your headset, on your headphones. Hola, profe. Hola, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks very much, Alison. Uh, actually, I want to thank you and thanks uh, for this time for these one year webinars every month in behalf of Venezuela, in behalf of the people of Venezuela. And we really appreciate it. And as I said before, you are our voice abroad. And we need someone who speak for Venezuela abroad. In Canada and in the, in the United States, we need that people speak about what's happening here. Indriana Parada, thanks Indriana, make a very clear explanation what, of what is happening with Alex Saab. And I will take only one word. The only sin of Alex Saab was to help Venezuelan with food, with medicine, with products for the industry. And that's his sin. And that's why he's been kidnapped in the United States and he's going to be prosecuted for things that he did not do. The only thing that he did was to help Venezuelans. So we will keep uh, helping uh, Alex Saab. The government of Venezuela is doing everything it can in order to defend Alex Saab from this uh, trial in which he's uh, put here in, 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 in Florida. Actually, uh, we have many friends abroad. I want to thank uh, David Denny, David, we are a mainland country, but we are a Caribbean country. We are not an island, but we are a Caribbean country. And we feel that we and the Caribbean are the same people. Uh, 
the coercive and unilateral measures are hurting very, very much to Venezuela today. Uh, we are in much better situation today than what we were two years ago, but we are still far away from what we need for our people. We need to have more opening to the possibility of sharing our products, of selling products, or buying products abroad. Uh, we need the possibility that our oil industry uh, develops much more than what is uh, at this moment, because that's our main, uh, main, our main resources come from the oil industry. And the coercive measures, what they call sanctions, are hurting very much the oil industry in Venezuela. As far as Canada is concerned, we think that the sanctions that Canada has on Venezuela are hurting the Venezuelans who live in Canada. For example, we, I have here 1,400 passports of Venezuelan, which I am unable to bring to Canada to give them to each one of those Venezuelan who, uh, who uh, did all the process to get it because we don't have the possibility to get a visa for bringing a uh, diplomatic bag to Canada. And the Venezuelan who are having kids in Canada are not able to get a, a birth certificate and no one can do a power of attorney, no one can uh, do, for example, certification. Many students that are required to have a certification of their degrees, of their diplomas, are not able to do it because Canada does not allow us to have a uh, uh, diplomat in Canada, even though the relations between Canada and Venezuela are still on. It's not like in the United States where they are close in, in, with Canada, our relations are open. So I think that the, if the Venezuelan in Canada put some pressure on the government, they probably will allow that Venezuela uh, open in the embassy, the possibility for Venezuelan to have, uh, to, to solve the problems that the Venezuelan have. Actually, the Venezuelans are, build, are, are building a problem on the Venezuelans that at the end is a problem of Canada. Because if the Venezuelan in Canada has problem, Canada has problem. So we are doing everything we can to see the possibility that we can offer more to Venezuelans in Canada. And we are finding how can we bring those 1,400 passports to, to Canada for the Venezuelan who needs their passport. We are processing about, uh, about 500 passports per, per month in, at the embassy. And it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be a point to process the passport if then we, we cannot bring them to, the, to, to Canada. So Venezuelans has a... Uh, I want to tell you that we are doing the best for you, but we are forced to, you know, to be close in the embassy for many of the operation, for the, many of the consular operations, because Canada does not allow us to have that open. And uh, again, I want to thank the uh, speakers of tonight. I want to thank. Uh, uh, for this time, because we think that this uh, monthly webinar has done, has done very, very much for Venezuela. The problems of Venezuela are well known at this moment for many in, in the, in, in abroad, because for this time took the, uh, took the position to open this program for people to know what's going on here. And things here 
we are fighting and we we know that we will win but things are very very hard still for venezuela thanks very much uh alison uh thanks to you for this uh, program and thanks to all the speakers Thank you, Professor Luis Acuna, the Charge de Affairs of Venezuela to Canada. It is an honor to have you with us each month uh, to hear your perspective um, from Venezuela when it comes to the necessity uh, to end the blockade and sanctions against Venezuela and to really fight for normalized relations between the government of Canada, the government of Venezuela, the government of the US and the government of Venezuela. Our next speaker has a lot of direct experience uh, when it comes uh, to this very fact, the fact that there are not normal relations uh, between the government of the US and that of Venezuela and direct on, the ha on hand experience as well with the US backed Venezuelan uh, self-declared so-called president Juan Guaido and his fake government. So I want to ask to join us next, a Dr. Adrian Pine. She is a US-based anthropologist and a retired professor who has worked in Honduras for over 25 years. Adrian was among the four members of the Embassy Protection Collective arrested in May 2019 for defending the Embassy of Venezuela in Washington, DC against its illegal takeover as part of the attempted coup by the US-backed Venezuelan self-declared so-called President Juan Guaido and his patrons in the US State Department. This was a very significant struggle in the United States, the Embassy Protection Collective, and it's uh, great to hear from you, Adrian, who I should mention has uh, just returned from Venezuela too. I'm, I might have sent her a message asking her to speak as she was getting off the plane. So it's great to have you, Adrian. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Allison. As you know, I was a little apprehensive um, at first because I don't consider myself the biggest expert on this topic, but thankfully those experts have just spoken. And so I do not have to cover the entirety of the violence of sanctions. Um, so I've, I've written something brief up here, so I'm gonna read from it. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that the fascism of today, neoliberal fascism, is not so much an overtly totalitarian state project as it is a project of capitalist empire. And it takes myriad forms, all of which involve hybrid warfare against communities. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu define neoliberalism as a program for destroying collective structures which may impede pure market logic. Where those communities are, for example, unsheltered people organizing to demand housing and services, native-led movements protesting pipelines, or Black people organizing to demand an end to police violence or the, to the very institution of the police within the United States, they're met with the violent militarized force of the state, which is complemented by media attacks, counterinsurgency strategies, and economic warfare in myriad forms. When the collective structure resisting pure market logic, which is of course the logic of today's empire, is a sovereign socialist state like Cuba or Venezuela, the stakes are that much higher. But the methods that empire uses to attack them in the end are structurally quite similar to those deployed against collectives e with even the mildest anti-capitalist bent. One of the things we noted while in the embassy were the absurdly similar tactics used by the US government in Venezuela and in Georgetown, where the embassy is located, to carry out their attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. I want to make clear that by drawing these comparisons, I am no way implying that our experience as embassy defenders was equivalent to what Venezuelans endure under the blockade. That's far worse. 
rather the tactics used by the empire are the same. In order to prevent our action in solidarity with Venezuelan sovereignty and in opposition to US-led regime change operations from succeeding, the US government illegally cut off our electricity just as it was attacking the electrical grid in Venezuela. Its security agents in collaboration with the violent opposition mob outside illegally cut off our water and prevented food from entering in an attempt to starve us out, just as sanctions aim to do. And of course, the DC and federal police forces collaborated with the opposition mob in continuous violent attacks against the embassy and those of us defending it. And the local and federal courts criminalized many of the embassy protection collective, um, both individuals who were outside supporting Venezuelan sovereignty and those four of us uh, who remained on the inside to the last, who were tried in a kangaroo court in which the judge instructed the jury that Guaido was in fact the legitimate president of Venezuela and refused to permit us to state otherwise or to mount any sort of defense at all. It was only by the miracle of the State Department's complete incompetence rooted in its hubris that we achieved a hung jury and avoided a year long federal prison sentence and a $100,000 fine each. Again, here, by no means am I arguing that my experience was even a fraction as horrifying as what is currently happening to Alex Saab, nor were the actions that led to my criminalization nearly as admirable. Rather, it demonstrates that the structural consistency of the tactics of hybrid warfare used by the US government, which is, of course, the main agent of neoliberal fascism worldwide, against those people who form part of the collective structures which may impede the pure market logic, in particular those pueblos, those nations that make a collective decision to refuse to adhere to the inhumane neoliberal economic model imposed by the empire that put, puts profit above all other things and who opt instead for a model based in the idea that all humans deserve those things we refer to as human rights, water, food, housing, health, education, a model which is of course grounded in the more intangible principles of respect, justice, and love. A few thoughts on the unilater unilateral coercive measures. Um, First of all, I, I just want to point out, of course, they're a deeply gendered kind of violence. Women bear the brunt of care work in good times and bad, just as we saw women disproportionately having to quit their jobs with the pandemic in the United States because of a tremendous unpaid increase in care work. Venezuelan women have seen a dramatic increase in care work in relation to the scarcity resulting from the implementation of the violent unilateral coercive measures. There's also a causal link between the hardships brought on by sanctions and an increase in gendered forms of violence in Venezuela, accompanied also by a decrease in funding for support services for the victims of such violence. And under sanctions, the importation and production of birth control pills, for example, has dramatically decreased, which has provoked a huge increase in unwanted pregnancies, and in particular teen pregnancies. As a scholar, one of the most painful things to watch, and one of the clearest examples, I think, of neoliberal fascism, has been the attacks um, on the, uh, based in the sanctions on Venezuela's really incredible Chavista literary project. It's affected the import and production of cultural goods like printed books in a country where millions of books of all genres had been previously distributed for free to citizens and residents nationwide. The maintenance of universities and research centers has suffered huge setbacks, and this in turn has constituted an attack on the ability of Venezuela to continue to provide free, high quality universal education all over the country. The embassy archives are extensive and are located in an enormous library in the basement of the embassy in Washington. Archives require very precise conditions to not quickly degrade, in particular air conditioning and humidity control. 
after the State Department violated the Vienna Convention by invading the embassy, arresting those of us who were there with the permission of the democratically elected government of Venezuela and took control on the, of the Venezuelan embassy on behalf of its puppet Guaido and his quote unquote ambassador, Carlos Vecchio, they staged a brief press conference and then boarded the building up. Two days ago, I went to the embassy. The damage was extensive and visible, even from the outside. Vines grew up around the boards covering the windows, themselves warped by Washington's humidity. If the plywood covering the embassy is warped, one can only imagine the state of the archives, which contain invaluable historical information unavailable and uh, anywhere else in the world. The United States uses the concepts of, of human rights and of free speech as weapons in its hybrid war against Venezuela, while, as we all know, it is the worst violator of those values in the world. Letting an invaluable archive rot or preventing the importation of produ or production of books for Venezuelans may not have the aesthetic impact of a mass book burning, but in the end, it is the same thing. It is fascism, neoliberal fascism. I want to, in closing, turn now to what is really the most amazing thing to me of all. We've seen the lengths that the United States is willing to go to attack people and nations who decide to choose a path based in values of love and justice rather than profit above all things. The violence of hybrid war, the violence of sanctions is truly horrifying. The over 40,000 excess deaths counted between 2017 and 2019 for Venezuela by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, or the illegal and murderous denial of vaccines and so many other medications to the Venezuelan people, um, just to give more examples. And what's really amazing in the midst of all of this is that even as Venezuela operates with 1% of its budget as a result of the criminal sanctions, and this is, again, I, I think has already been mentioned, what Elena Duhan, the UN Special Rapporteur asserted, even as Venezuela is battered on all fronts, even as its medical system and infrastructure has been devastated, it is still a healthier, happier place than its neighbors. Venezuela has had dramatically fewer COVID infections and deaths than Colombia or the United States, for example. Hundreds of thousands of Venezuelan immigrants realizing this have returned to Venezuela because conditions are frankly better for them at home than abroad even with the scarcity caused by sanctions. Nearly 4 million housing units have been delivered to Venezuelans and continue to be built. And the country distributes food to the population through the CLAP program and is moving toward food sovereignty in the face of the US attempt to starve it, starve it out. And even in the face of the tremendous violence of the sanctions and the political and election interference led by the United States, Year after year, Venezuelans demonstrate at the polls that they prefer to stand up to neoliberal fascism. Venezuela has increasingly teamed with other nations subject to unilateral coercive measures to increase their collective ability to resist the violence of the hybrid war of neo, neo warfare of neoliberal empire. It is all this that gives me hope, in spite of the apparent juggernaut that is neoliberal fascism. Having been criminalized by the United States government for standing up to US imperialism, I feel a particular kinship with Alex Saab, even though, as I noted before, my actions and the violence with which they were met don't even begin to approach um, what Saab uh, has done and what he is enduring. Standing with Alex Saab is a deeply important part of our international struggle against neoliberal fascism. And I'm so grateful to have been invited to this forum and to be fighting with you all for his freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adrian Pine, a uh, scholar, but also activist organizer. Uh, we definitely uh, need more uh, folks like you to make those important links and realize that we can talk about the impact of sanctions we can give all the statistics or talk about the political economy of Venezuela and what's happening, but that's not what we need to be doing. What we need to be doing is, is taking action to fight against these criminal sanctions and blockade and really stand with the people of Venezuela who you and I have both seen are asserting their independence, their sovereignty, 
every day and really struggling under very difficult uh, conditions as the U.S. attempts to overthrow their democratically elected government, threatens them with all sorts of forms of psychological warfare, warships off the coast, U.S.-sponsored coups, and the Venezuelan people have continued to stay strong. Um, so thank you, Dr. Adrian Pine, for, for that uh, presentation and your continued uh, struggle. Um, we will continue to work together and, and to um, really fight until, until we win. The uh, next part of our program, I wanna give people a heads up. We're gonna be inviting everyone to turn on their cameras. Put up a fist, smile, express your solidarity against these sanctions and for freedom of Alex Saab. So just watch on your screen, there'll be a, a message that pops up that says you've been invited to become a panelist. And if you accept that, you'll be able to turn on your camera and we'll take a united group photo. But before then, we just have one um, more speaker, a, a greeting. Um, I do wanna say just quickly that uh, we have a regrets for tonight's picket from Sakaya Thomas with the Global African Congress, uh, which is an organization based here in Canada. Uh, he was not able to make it, but the Global African Congress and Sakaya Thomas send their solidarity uh, for an end to sanctions on Venezuela and freedom for Alex Saab. There are people on this call, uh, many from, from Venezuela, and it is absolutely incredible to see your messages of solidarity and commitment to freedom for Alex Saab but also people from provinces across Canada and Quebec. So thank you all for joining for this 12th monthly online picket action. Um, for our uh, final speaker for, for today, before we go to the group photo, I want to invite up Andrew Berry. Andrew is here to give greetings from Mobilization Against War and Occupation, Anti-War Coalition uh, here in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, he will be joining us in just one second. Hello, thanks, Allison. Um, I just wanted to say that also last Thursday, last Friday marked the 30th anniversary of a very significant day in the history of Venezuela, February the 4th. 1992, when Comandante Chavez uh, led an uprising against the corrupt neoliberal uh, regime, US backed regime of that day. Um, in the decades and centuries prior to this, February the 4th, 1992, the US and their allies continuously stole and controlled all the resources of Venezuela and kept a very small percentage of the people with wealth while the majority suffered in poverty. And I think that it's very significant that we uh, mark this also, it was 30 years ago when this happened and uh, the attacks that happened on the rights of Venezuelans prior to this in 1992 were very extreme. They were very brutal and harsh. In 1989, the Caracaso, when over 3000 Venezuelans were murdered by the state this led to uh, many Venezuelans being absolutely frustrated, no longer could tolerate the situation anymore. And when Chavez, Comandante Chavez led this in 1992, it did not succeed on that day. That day was a failure, but it gave hope. It gave an inspiration to the millions of poor people in Venezuela who had been historically oppressed by the United States and Europe and to a lesser degree, Canada as well, that benefited from this situation. And I think that when Venezuela was able to succeed, when Hugo Chavez took power in 1999 through democratic elections, it was the beginning of something that the United States could no longer control in Venezuela. That hope, that inspiration for the United States was the worst thing that could happen. And the people in Venezuela have not turned back. They have endured so much since then, so much more attacks and violence from the United States and Canada and their allies. The right wing media in Venezuela has worked tirelessly every day against the Venezuelan process. 
the 2002 coup d'etat where President Hugo Chavez was kidnapped for 48 hours, the oil sabotage and blockade of 2002 and 2003, the continued sanctions and blockade that have happened, the street violence through the garimbas and escualidos that happened in 2014 and 2017. This has all culminated until 2020 with the kidnapping of Alex Saab, a man who stood up and said that we will do what we can and we will put our lives on the line to make sure that the poor people in Venezuela get their food and get their rights against the blockade, against the sanctions of the United States. And he's suffering for that, for doing that. And it's ironic, the United States says that they have been fighting for democracy and freedom around the world. while well, Alex Saab, a man who wanted to guarantee food for the people in Venezuela is kidnapped and in a prison in the United States for doing so. And Canada has been very much a significant partner to the United States attacks on the people of Venezuela. It was Justin Trudeau who led this Lima group, this Lima cartel of countries of right-wing regimes in Latin America that participate actively every day against the democratic will of the people of Venezuela. Canada has participated in not recognizing the democratically elected government of Nicolas Maduro and instead recognized a guy who went up in a plaza and said, I am now the president of the country. This is a shame on Canada. It's a shame that Canada is participating. It's a shame the United States are doing this to the people of Venezuela and people here in Canada and the United States will continue to defend the people in Venezuela who are suffering from the consequences of the imperialist intentions of Trudeau, of Biden, of Trump, of the different governments that have been in power since Venezuela took its power back in 1999. And it's ironic also that Canada can preach anything about human rights to people in Venezuela, to President Maduro in Venezuela, considering the genocidal history of Canada against indigenous people here. This has been going on for over 500 years there have been residential schools where Canada kidnapped children, killed hundreds of thousands of indigenous children. Even today, 2022, there is no clean drinking water in many reserves, in many communities for indigenous people. There is no access to health care. And Canada is going to preach about human rights to Venezuela. The same Canada that participated in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, the coup d'etat in Haiti, supported the coup d'etat in Honduras, and in Ukraine, continues to support Israel's attacks on Palestine. The, it arms Saudi Arabia against the people of Yemen today. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. We will continue to support and we will continue to defend the rights of Venezuelans and call for the immediate release of Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Thank you, Andrew Barry from Mobilization Against War and Occupation in Vancouver. As I mentioned, there are people from across Canada and the, and the United States on this call, many different organizations. You can see the greetings in the chat. Please continue to follow the chat and post, of course, your greetings and solidarity. We are moving to the next section of the program. As I mentioned, it is our group photo our time to invite everyone to turn on their cameras, to express our solidarity with Alex Saab against these criminal sanctions. Uh, I, before we do that, and we at the same time, we'll also turn off the translation function. Um, I wanted to also just say a big thank you again to our speakers that have joined in this one year anniversary. We've had 12 months of these consecutive picket actions. I also see many previous speakers have joined us in the chat, um, but today we heard from Indriana Parada, the Venezuelan lawyer and member of the movement for the liberation of Alex Saab. We had a video greeting from Camilla Saab, the wife of Alex Saab. We had David Denny, from the Secretary General of Friends of Venezuela Committee, and Dr. Adrian Pine the US-based anthropologist and member of the Embassy Protection Collective, and greetings from Professor Luis Acuna, direct from Venezuela, the Charge Affairs in the Venezuela Embassy in Canada. Thank you again for your words today and for joining. 
um, from the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, Canada, and all other groups and individuals that have joined in today. Next month, our picket action, which will be the 13th consecutive month, will be March 10th, also at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and 8 p.m. time in Caracas. The information to register for that is in the chat, and uh, we'll be sending updates about speakers soon. As we promote people and invite you to turn on your cameras, I'm going to turn off the interpretation function and then also play a video from the Venezuelan group, Un Solo Pueblo. We will um, just listen and watch a short video called Viva Venezuela as people turn on their cameras. The so United Together, we say, free Alex Saab, hands off Venezuela. And of course, this uh, event has been possible with the incredible interpretation um, by our friends Salome and Mercedes. They've done a great job working very hard uh, all afternoon, and we are grateful to be able to hold this simultaneously interpreted event. So. Uh, Viva Venezuela and let's enjoy the video. It may take a few minutes to get everyone upgraded because there's a lot of us on the call, uh, but enjoy this video together and we will unite our voices shortly. Viva Venezuela, mi patria querida, quien la libertó mi hermano fue Simón Bolívar. Viva Venezuela, mi patria querida, quien la libertó mi hermano fue Simón Bolívar. de ser humano para nuestra independencia.
recuerdo siempre estar en la memoria por eso lo recordamos y así lo dice la historia Bolívar no está muerto siempre está en nuestra memoria por eso lo recordamos y así lo dice la historia Ok, bueno, estamos en los últimos momentos de nuestra acción para libertad para Alex Saab y para exigir fin al bloqueo contra Venezuela. Um, si recibiste una invitación a abrir su cámara y unirnos en el área de, de panelistas, por favor, acepte esta invitación y abre su cámara. Y uh, vamos a tener una foto grupal. We are going to have a group photo. Um, I'm going to invite all the folks one more time. If you'd like to turn on your cameras, bring your smile, bring a flag or a sign, and we'll take a group photo together where we are uh, uniting our voices to demand freedom for Alex Saab and an end to these criminal sanctions. There have been people uh, united across Canada, the United States, and of course, our brothers and sisters fighting in Venezuela um, for and into these criminal sanctions and demanding freedom for Alex Saab. Um, we will continue these actions. As has been mentioned, February 16th, Alex Saab will be in front of a uh, hearing in, I believe this time in Georgia, uh, but we will uh, be on social media and uh, on the streets where possible and wherever we can to demand his immediate freedom. Vamos en atento por el día 16 de febrero. Este es un día cuando es posible él va a estar en el corto, Alex Saab, y necesitamos montar todas nuestras um, Voces para Libertad de Alex Saab en este día muy importante, el 16 de febrero, esta próxima semana, y estoy invitado todo a participar en acciones en línea y también en sus ciudades. Y ahora vamos a tomar esta foto. Pienso que es el tiempo para finalizar nuestra acción unido hoy en apoyo de Alex Saab y contra la los bloqueos criminales contra Venezuela. Si recibe esta invitación, abre su cámara. Ok. So I see many people have their signs and their smiles and everything ready. Absolutely great and um, beautiful to see everyone united here today. Put up a fist. And let's say together, free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alexa. Lift the blockade on Venezuela. Venezuela sí, sanciones no. Venezuela sí, sanciones no. Los Unidos tremenda. Okay, hasta la próxima es el día el um, 10 de marzo, pero hay otro acciones entre um, marzo y ahora. Y vamos a estar atento por el evento del 16 de febrero. Estamos con, uh, contigo, Camila Saab. Estamos con los pueblos venezolanos. Y hasta la próxima vez, venceremos. 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 Hasta la victoria siempre. Venceremos. Venceremos. Venceremos.